Okay, let's go ahead and get started. Hello, my name is Ted Holsey. I'm Vice President of Marketing at eFolder and your host for today's event. Welcome to the eFolder Partner Chats. This webinar series brings together leading eFolder partners for business-oriented discussion. The topic for today is seven great reasons to upgrade legacy BDRs now. Today we are joined by Eric Thorsell, President of Success Computer Consulting. In just a minute I will further introduce Eric. Before we go through the agenda, let's cover a few housekeeping items. Um, today's session is being recorded. The recorded version of the webinar will be made available on eFolder's YouTube channel. We will also make copies of the slides available to those who attended the event. With over 100 people registered for today's session, we have put all participants in listen-only mode. You can enjoy the audio portion of today's event by either streaming it to your computer or, or by dialing in over the phone. Questions are strongly encouraged throughout, <clears throat> throughout today's webinar. Excuse me. We have planned a special Q&A section at the end of today's discussion, but you may submit them as we go along and we will try to address your questions on the fly. Let me talk a little bit about today's agenda. First, Eric is going to give a good background um, discussion on Success Computer Consulting and how they have successfully grown their BDR franchise over the past few years. Next, Eric is going to walk you through his experience of upgrading nearly 40 legacy BDRs to eFolder. He will share key insights he has gained along the way and his company and how his company has benefited from upgrading their client BDRs. And lastly, we will have plenty of time for your questions during the Q&A section. Now let me introduce today's guest. Eric Thorsell is founder and president of Success Computer Consulting. He started Success Computer Consulting in 1992 in a spare bedroom of his home. Originally serving larger companies, Eric decided to shift his focus to small and medium-sized organizations. He knew that if he brought his corporate experience to these clients, he'd be able to develop a service offering that really made a noticeable difference to them. Today, more than 18 years later, Success Computer Consulting's talented team is based at its Golden Valley, Minnesota headquarters. SEC's clients include small to medium businesses, nonprofit organizations, and educational institutions. Eric, thanks for joining us, and welcome. Hi, Ted. Thanks so much for having me, and hello to everybody who's on the webinar. Glad you were able to join us today. So like Ted said, I'm going to start out by just telling you a little bit about our company and what we do, uh, and a little bit about our history, and then talk to you a little bit about what I see as some key reasons uh, to consider eFolder uh, and consider migrating to eFolder uh, BDRs from old legacy BDRs as well. So some, some stuff about me and stuff about my company first just to kind of kick this off. I mean, nothing is more fascinating to me than me myself. So, Ted, if this part about me goes on longer than maybe three hours, if you could just rein me in, that would be great. Um, Ted, I don't know if you put the picture of the Pillsbury Doughboy on this screen or if I did. I can't remember, but people who know me know that my first job out of college was to be the Pillsbury Doughboy. I put on an eight-foot-high costume and made appearances all around the country and on TV as the Pillsbury Doughboy. In addition, when you look at things like my LinkedIn that Ted had shown a little bit ago, you can see my background is in music education. Um, and I've also worked for American Express Company also. It was called IDS Financial Services on that LinkedIn page. So you can see I have absolutely no business being in this industry whatsoever. My background is, is in completely different areas. I've had to learn by having the business. You know, I've had to learn, like many of us learn, by trying things, making mistakes, having successes, and do things over again. But I certainly didn't learn a lot about running a business like this in my <laughs> by going to college or by being the Pillsbury Doughboy. So anyway, that's why the picture is up there. Today our company is Success Computer Consulting, and I apologize, I should have updated these, but we have about 40 people, actually, about 26 engineers and technicians, been in business for 20 years. Um, and as it says on the slide, I've been a member of HTG for a little over seven years, and I facilitated a group for four years in HTG. If you're familiar with the Heartland Technology Groups, um, I found it to be a really important uh, resource and relationship to help me learn some new skills about how to manage and lead in my business, how to do planning in my business, and how to engage with vendor partners in a new and productive way. Um, I'll say that I met or became acquainted with eFolder through my participation in HTG. And I am succeeding to some degree in my relationship with eFolder because of what I learned in HTG about how to engage with vendor partners. And my experience in engaging with eFolder has been very strong and very positive, so that's why I'm here to tell you about it. 
Uh, Ted mentioned that when I started my business, we worked with large companies. So my first, my first client was my former employer, American Express, and then other large businesses here in Minneapolis, like Target stores and that kind of thing. And quickly switched, I think, for the same reason a lot of us work with small businesses, because we know we can make uh, an impact in smaller organizations that we can see and feel, and it feels more exciting to be correct, uh, connected to the mission of those organizations and to really know that I'm taking care of them, that we're protecting them. Uh, and that they can count on us in a way that it's harder just to matter for a large, a large company. Uh, we focus on small businesses. Our, our legacy, like a lot of partners out there, comes through Microsoft Small Business Server, those kinds of things. Um, and we've traditionally served that type of client. Uh, in the last five years, we've also really focused on kind of growing up the size of client that we work with. So our ideal customer today is someone that has maybe between 50 and 500 users on their network, rather than just focusing on those that have you know, 10 to 30. So still, those smaller networks are a key part of our business, and they're the majority of our business. But we're also trying to learn how to serve those mid-market clients, because we understand that they have more budgets and sometimes more complex problems to work on, and that's been, that's, uh, been fun for us as well. The other thing I've mentioned about our history is that up until about six, seven years ago, we were 10 or 12 people. And we made a decision, or I made a decision, I guess, as an owner, to grow my business. I, I you know, for a long time thought, and maybe this is because I kind of didn't believe in my ability to do it, thought I got to keep the business small because it'll be more personal that way. And ultimately I thought, you know, I can, I can, I can't keep my business small and have it be financially healthy. A healthy business has to grow. And, and so in order to build financial strength in my business, it was important to grow and to choose partners to work with to do that. HTG, partnering with eFolder, those kinds of things have always uh, really uh, has helped us to drive our growth. And then finally, before I go into the whole discussion about BDRs, I want to talk about some shifts that we've made in our managed service offerings because some of it, um, some of the shifts we've made are are different from, I think, what a lot of other people are doing with managed services. And, and in our world, uh, we used to, when we started doing a managed service offering, I don't know when it was 12 years ago or something like that, we positioned it as, one, as an all-you-can-eat kind of agreement that had a fixed price per user or per device and provided basically unlimited support for that. And what we learned in the process was that we were not insurance companies. We didn't know how to properly sort of underwrite our clients' networks and make good choices so that we set pricing in a way that the, the price was palatable to customers and they wanted to buy, but also was high enough that we could make profit. So we came to a strategy around our managed services a few years ago where we kind of treated it as an a la carte, where our clients can pick different components that they want to build together into a plan. But we don't provide unlimited support. And as I talk about how we price BDRs, you'll see that, I've, that we don't bundle a lot of human labor in with, with the BDR offering. And so I wanted to just mention that now so that when I talk about how we price it, that will make some sense. We, we still provide human labor. We just charge separately for that. So that's just some basic background info about us. And what I'll do now is kind of head into uh, some more details about those seven reasons why we've decided to replace uh, legacy BDRs. And so in order to talk about that, before I go into the first reason, let me say that when we started selling BDRs, it was from another provider, and I won't, I won't mention who, but it, it almost doesn't matter. I mean, you could pick from any number of them. Uh, but we were an early adopter of BDRs, and um, we were excited about what they meant for our business. You know, first of all, BDRs obviously were a great solution compared to having clients use tape and that kind of stuff or using a bunch of USB hard drives. Um, this was really, it felt like sort of an enterprise class offering. And, and as a business owner, it made me feel comfortable that I could go to clients and make a commitment to them that says, you know what, you can sleep at night. Your data is safe with us. And if something goes wrong, we're going to be able to get you back. You know, I've been in the position where I've said that and not always been completely sure that we were going to be able to deliver on that promise. Shame on me, but that was a, the big, a big deal was, you know, gosh, if tapes don't work, I can't restore. Or maybe it'll all work, but it will take too long. 
And BDRs were attractive because now we had a way to make a commitment to clients that had a recovery time objective that we knew we could keep. And so um, the idea of BDRs was a really exciting uh, possibility for us. The challenge for us was, unfortunately, we got, I think, about 70 BDRs out into our client base from this other provider, was that the vendor and the technology just didn't perform as advertised. Um, I mean, sometimes it did. A lot of the time it did. But you don't need very many exceptions before you can't sleep anymore. And we had an experience, I talk about a client of ours that we had in Southern California, and we're up here in Minneapolis. You know, and who cares where they are? We can do things remotely, right? Uh, except that there's, they had a small business server and it crashed. And we wanted to virtualize on their BDR. This is not an eFolder BDR. This was the other company I'm mentioning. And when we virtualized, we were able to virtualize the server, except that all the exchange data was corrupted in the backup. It wasn't corrupted on the original server, but it had been backed up improperly, let's say, to the BDR, and we could not start Microsoft Exchange. And without going into a bunch of technical stuff where I'll get lost, because frankly, I'm not that technical anyway, what I can tell you is I was up all night and I don't even have the technical skills to solve it, but I was up all night, frankly, with worry. I like this client. They're good people. They've been our client for 10 years, and I knew how important it was to have his business up and running, and I just didn't know how we were going to deliver. And the fact that that BDR backed up all this data in a way that didn't work and that the monitoring and alerting around it didn't catch any of this and lulled us into a sense of, you know, a false sense of security is, is terrifying. We now know what functionality is missing from that vendor's BDRs, and we know that we simply can't make the promise that we want to be able to make to our clients around that technology. So technical reliability is the first reason why I would be taking a look at whether or not the BDRs I have in place are the right BDRs for my clients and the right BDRs that allow me to keep the promise. eFolder has uh, on-site recovery and a lot of different cloud-based recovery options, but also eFolder does proactive error checking that detects these kinds of problems that we experienced. We had that California thing happen with two other clients with that same vendor's BDRs. We could not get their exchange data uh, recovered through the BDR. We were able to recover it. We had to spend a lot of money with the data recovery service and do those kinds of things to be able to keep our promise. And I can't run a business, and I know you probably can't either, having to keep promises by doing those extraordinary and expensive things. And it puts, it, it puts relationships with clients to the test. So switching to eFolder has, that has that proactive error checking has allowed us to relax, has allowed us to be confident. When eFolder tells us that our data is stored properly, we believe them. And for the record, you know, now we have over 60 eFolder BDRs out there. We have never had an eFolder BDR fail us in any respect. Uh, so technical re reliability is number one. I can keep my promise. So another reason that I think it's important to look at the BDRs that uh, we're providing to clients is that clients' needs change. The most obvious example is that they have more data this year than they had last year, and they're going to have more data next year than they had this year. The only thing we don't know, we know that for a fact. I mean, no one has less, well, I shouldn't say no one, but very few people have the amount of data that they use decrease over time. We know it's going to increase. We just don't know how much. And we don't know how much their business is going to change. We don't know if they're going to launch some new application that requires a new instance of a server. We don't know if they're going to open up new locations. There's a lot we can't predict. In the olden days, when we were selling the uh, brand X B, uh, BDRs, I don't know if X, I didn't mean anything by X, by the way, so don't, don't try and interpret who that is. Brand B, brand B. Let's just, we'll stick to brand the top B. part of the alphabet. So in the olden days, when we were selling brand B's BDRs, there were two models to choose from, and that was it. So it was pretty easy to pick a model because it was really a choice between which one was the least bad match for our clients' needs. <laughs> um, you know, you tried to find a model that had enough hard drive space to store as much data as you thought they would accrue over whatever the useful life of that device might be, three years. 
And then you also had to have enough processing power and RAM to be able to virtualize the sessions that you needed to virtualize when something went wrong. And the way it was with those BDRs was kind of like what we bought was what we got. And our, the, the challenge is our clients' needs don't stop or don't stop changing when they buy a BDR. They continue to evolve as organizations. So being able to evolve the hardware and the offering that I provide for backup to clients becomes critical to me. So um, with, you know, if I can't, if I have to buy a BDR up front that's going to meet all these possible needs down the road, I guess my choices are to either really overbuy based on today's needs, just spending a lot of money that they're not going to even take advantage of for a few, a few years as they grow into that BDR, or to take the risk and underbuy knowing that I'm going to have to throw the thing away um, or replace it uh, when my client grows. E-Folder gives me choices so that I can tailor my BDR solution to client needs. So first of all, you can see on the screen there are five different models to choose from. There's a fairly broad array of tech uh, specs on each of those models. So I have a much better chance of matching my customer's needs to a device to recommend to them. So now it's not which of these two is the worst match. It's which one lines up best with who they are today and who we think they're going to become. So the next thing I would say that I like is that uh, eFolder BDR models can be customized with RAM and storage packs. We get to really right-size those BDRs to the client needs. So when they first buy the BDR, if we think it needs more RAM than is in the spec, we can add it. Or a year from now, if we think they need more storage than is in the device, we can add it. So we're not stuck with having to replace that model or hopefully find some other client to put that small model into once a client outgrows it. Uh, instead, the BDR can grow as our client's needs change and grow. Um, so that field upgradability is really a huge benefit to us. Um, and, and it's important to point out it's not just about upgrading storage. It's about upgrading RAM, too, so that we can run uh, the virtual sessions we need to be able to run. And then the last thing I want to talk about, and I think this is really cool on reason number two here, evolving client needs, is that eFolder has an ability for us to build our own BDRs uh, with eFolder Cloud for Shadow Protect, which is what we use. So that's been really interesting. Our company is an IBM business partner. We sell our clients the value of buying IBM. So whether you're IBM or Dell or HP or something else, you usually have some kind of messaging around why you represent that brand. We talk to our clients about what we believe is reliability, a good service experience, engineering from IBM that we think is is great. So then when we come in with some white box BDR, whether it's from eFolder or someone else, it's a little weird to explain. I mean, clients see all these IBM servers in their rack, and they know why they're there. We told them why that was, but they can't imagine why when they buy the server that we expect for them from our solution, that's not IBM. So the idea that we could start having a consistent message to clients was intriguing. But the thing that really tipped the scales for us and is making us go into IBM is, is selling IBM-built BDRs. Well, we build them based on IBM servers. Is we, you know, we bought about $100,000 worth of BDRs from eFolder last year. And I could have $100,000 worth of additional sales revenue show up with IBM if I built BDRs on IBM. That means I get you know, a higher program level with IBM. That means I get more marketing money and other support and rebates from them for selling that stuff. So we decided it was worth it to start building our own IBM branded uh, BDR, BDR appliances and putting those in the client site. And what's been really amazing about that is that eFolder has been 100% supportive of the process. I thought that, you know, that they would see us as competing with their hardware, but they don't. Their goal is to have us build our BDR businesses and to store our data with eFolder so that it can be secure for clients. So eFolder stepped up. They provided great documentation for our techs about how to build our own BDRs. We're leaning on their support team to make sure that everything's kind of working right. Um, and we know that our IBM built it ourselves BDRs will be fully supported by the eFolder team. And that, to me, is what partnership looks like. eFolder wants partners to be successful in all areas of their business. Now we get to sell more IBM servers, 
which by the way, we know those servers better. We have replacement parts for them, that kind of stuff. We'll also strengthen our e-folder relationships. So that feels like a real win-win uh, to me. So reason number three, transparent and predictable wholesale pricing. I was talking to Ted about this on the phone yesterday and telling him this story about how when we first learned about BDRs from Brand B, <laughs> um, when, the, when they were sold to us, we understood that after we finished paying for them, because we were paying for them on a three-year kind of payment plan, that that was like the gravy train arrives. You know, once you finish making those payments, you still get to charge your clients the same thing, but you've paid off and own the BDR by that point and that there would be some really small charge for warranty. And we were very surprised when the warranty fees were announced three years into it that were exactly the same price as buying the box. So we didn't get that, that payoff that was an important part of our financial model for how BDRs were going to work. And that damaged trust big time between us and Brand B. <laughs> um, they, we felt like when the, client, when the vendor told us how the pricing was going to work, how the warranty would go, that they have a responsibility to honor their word. And that particular vendor just really didn't feel that way. Um, they felt no obligation uh, they, to, to honor that earlier price. So that created a, a bigger trust issue, or another trust issue, along with the technical trust issue, which was, wow, I mean, can I predict what this is going to cost on the road? And what if they change the whole financial model again? By comparison, eFolder makes it exactly clear what you pay for, what the appliance costs, what the software costs, what the BDR and cloud services costs, what the fixed costs are, what the variable costs are. There's a lot of numbers in formulating how you're going to price and sell a BDR, and it can be complex. But it is made a lot easier if the vendor gives you numbers that you can believe in and you trust the vendor to honor their quotes to you. And that's been a really big thing for us. We wanted to get rid of the fleet of BDRs we have out there that have a cost basis that we can't predict. And, by the way, don't perform technically the way we want them to. So that was a, a significant factor for us as well. And I want to show you, whoops, I hit the button wrong. I want to show you this screen, the eFolder e BDR cost wizard. Um, we use this spreadsheet. Uh, in our sales team, along with our techs, to quote out all of our BDRs. We don't show this spreadsheet to our clients because this shows what our wholesale costs are. But the eFolder cost wizard um, really lets us gather all the relevant information from clients so we get an accurate and complete quote. The great thing is that we can know to use these questions to start conversations with clients. After all, who's going to know how much the client's business is going to grow? Is it going to be me that knows that or the client? Well, if we know that the client has a better sense of that, even if they're not technical, we can start to use this cost wizard to facilitate a conversation with clients. So the client takes some accountability for the assumptions we made. So it's one thing for me to say, all right, you know, client, I see that your data has grown 10% a year in the last three years, so we're just going to base our future growth assumptions on that, and so this is the right size BDR. Using the cost wizard and the questions here, instead what we're doing is saying, well, here's the historical stuff we've seen. But, you know, the past doesn't necessarily promise what the future is going to look like. So let's have a conversation about the growth of your business. Do you think the growth of your business will speed up? Do you think the way you're generating data is changing? Are you, dealing, are you producing uh, higher volumes of data per client or per engagement or per project? You know, by having that conversation and asking the client to be involved in making some of those predictions, then when the predictions are inevitably wrong, right, we don't predict that stuff perfectly, and maybe their needs are a little greater than what we predicted. We can go back to the client and say, well, you know what? When we were estimating this stuff together, we came up with this number. But here's the reality. What do you think we ought to do about that? And it's a collaborative discussion rather than a situation where the client feels like, well, you told me to buy this thing. So the BDR Cost Wizard is a really great tool for helping us to build some of that accountability into the sales process with the client. Um, and I think it's a, just another example of one of the tools that eFolder gives us to help us succeed in the marketplace. So Eric, so, before we kind yeah. of move on, let, let me just make a comment, because the question usually comes up, you know, well, where can I get a copy of the, the cost wizard? And I just want to remind everybody, if you're an existing eFolder partner, um, you just go to the Partner Center, 
and type in wizard or cost wizard and it will it'll pop right up there um, so just and if you are um, not yet an eFolder partner and you want to take a look at it as a part of your um, evaluation of us as a as a partner ask your sales representative for a copy of the of the cost wizard or ask them to provision you a a, a trial account so just that you that question usually comes up. It hasn't yet, but so presume maybe everybody on the line knows where to find it. But I would also want to remind everyone that uh, to please ask questions as we go along. I'm, while Eric is speaking, I'm monitoring the Q&A log. So if you do have a question, please just uh, please interject. Thank you. Cool. So next slide, reason four, keep your promises. This is my most important slide in my presentation. <laughs> this is what matters to me most viscerally. I believe that, and I know I'm not alone in this, our clients are extending a huge amount of trust to us uh, to take care of their technology. It's, technology is often kind of mysterious and frustratingly complex for clients. And so at a certain point, unless they want to become network engineers themselves, they have to just stop trying to understand how it works and decide if they can trust their partner to do what's in their best interest. And and that's, you know, a trusted advisor relationship. And when our clients put their trust in us, there's a huge burden there. We have a huge responsibility to make sure that we deliver on the promises that we make to those clients. And when things look like they may, may not, it might not be possible to deliver on that, I think we have to, we have to recognize when those situations exist and we have to take action. We're, I think we're morally obligated, or at least I feel like we are in my company to do the right thing even when it's painful. So I said that we had a fleet of about 60 of brand B BDRs out with our clients, and we owned them. The way we were doing BDRs at the time was we were actually buying them and owning them and then just charging our clients a fee to use them. So we had about $400,000 worth of BDRs, or we do currently have about $400,000 in BDRs in our fixed assets on our balance sheet. That's pretty significant for a small business. And it makes me feel pretty attached to those devices. I don't want to lose them, right? I paid for those, and I want to keep them in production and get as much revenue out of those devices as I can. But the reality was different from that. It, it did not make that possible, I guess. The reality was I told you about the client in California where we couldn't, we couldn't get back their exchange data using the BDR, and that we'd seen problems in two other clients, too. And we looked at those 60 BDRs and we said, holy cow, well, we don't have $400,000 to spend. We can't get rid of those right away. But we have a, an obligation to put in equipment that we believe is good and that will let us keep our promises to our clients. And when you think about the risk of not keeping the promise, I mean, it's huge. And this is what I lose sleep about. I mean, any time if you've had the experience of a technician making a mistake out with a client, you have to get that flash of that feeling of like, oh, man, you know. I'm going to have to tell the client the truth. They're going to be mad. What if I can't fix it? What if this impacts my public reputation? Those kinds of fears, you know, took my peace of mind to zero, basically. So the most important factor for us in choosing a new BDR partner was this. I needed to be able to fully trust them like my clients trust me. I needed to trust their technology so that, um, so it would, you know, but I needed to also trust their claims about the technology. I was never going to understand all the inner workings of the BDR and all the, all the software and utilities that are on a BDR as well as the people who pulled it together. So I needed to trust them. And I needed to trust them to do business ethically and honestly. You know, that thing I told you about pricing. I want to I feel like I'm dealing with people that have a high level of integrity and whose word is good. And i got to tell you, it was really a drag to make a decision that we were going to replace all of those brand B BDRs at our own expense, mostly, uh, or partially, I should say. Um, but it, as painful financially as a decision, a decision as that was, it lets me sleep at night. And we feel proud of our business for making the huge investment to put in different BDRs just so we can keep our promise to clients. I, I think in our industry, this is the most important thing we can do. And when it comes to data protection, business continuity, I can't think of many technologies we deal with 
where the promise is as big and significant and and it, and it involves as much risk as with data backups. So reason number four, you'll be able to keep your promise to clients. And that is a big deal. So moving on to the next slide here. Um, oh, <laughs> I think Ted and I both moved at the same time. Or maybe, Ted, you just want me to skip reason five. <laughs> no, I don't think, no. I'm just kidding no. here. Let me move it back. Uh-oh. Try again. Let me see if I can. Let me see if I can. I'll let you here. take it to five, and I'll just talk. Right. Here we go. Go ahead. <laughs> All right. So, reason five: changing BDRs, refreshing from old legacy BDR technology to new technology, gives us an opportunity to reset client expectations. And I think it's a good idea. We've learned a lot about backup in the years since BDRs have been around. And we've learned a lot about how do we craft the promise to clients? How do we size our solution properly for them? How do we think about how to share risk? And we also have to be realistic about what the cost is. So we need to be able to have a conversation with clients that helps to kind of reset their thinking about how a BDR or how backup technology should work. Um, you know, the original idea that we were sold when we bought BDRs was, hey, you know what? You manage service provider, you buy these BDRs. You should own these BDRs. And this gives you a huge advantage, they would say. They said, Eric, buy the BDR. And hey, if a client outgrows it, no problem. You own it. You can take it back, get them a new bigger one. And you can redeploy that old BDR at some, some other client. But the, the, and I guess the, let me add that I think the client needs in that assumption were that all clients are the same. You know, so you can mix and match these BDRs out in the field because the BDRs are the same because the client needs are basically the same. Um, none of that's true. Our clients grow at different rates. Clients come in all shapes and sizes. They have unique needs. And by the way, getting good hardware is not free. We had plenty of hardware problems with BDRs before, and we're tired of that too. It's disruptive. It costs us a huge amount of money to deal with broken hardware. So reliability requires not just quality software and quality cloud services, but also the quality hardware. And that goes to our IBM message that we use. The client needs the right hardware, and they should pay for it. And in my belief, they should own it. So we are using this refresh as an opportunity to change the model from one where we own the hardware to one where our clients own the hardware. And I know a lot of people already do that. But for those who, who approached it in the way we did, we see that this refresh is a great opportunity to say, you know what, we've learned a lot, uh, Mr. Ms. Client, and it's in your interest to own this hardware. Pay us a fee for operating it and for storing all your data and making sure that stuff is going to be good. And you know it's going to work for you, but there's really no reason for you not to own the hardware, to be able to upgrade it when you need it, uh, that kind of thing. So, um, bottom line is, I can't deliver on my promise if I have to to live within some old set of expectations my clients have from years ago that a BDR should be cheap, and it's a one size fits all proposition. So. I can't deliver on my promise if I have to use the cheapest, lowest price technology. I can't meet your one-hour recovery time objective if the only tool you let me use for, for backup is out of date. Or maybe a less extreme example, I can't be sure I can meet your recovery time objective, Mr. Client, if the BDR you let me use is the cheapest one without regard for the quality of the vendor. We have to match our client needs with a quality solution from a dependable vendor in order to keep our promise. And, and so looking at the BDRs you have out there that are probably getting long in the tooth, that need to probably get replaced, or that are reaching their end of life with current vendor, creates an opportunity with you to, for you to reopen the conversation with clients and look at how you sell it differently, too, to make sure that that works for you. So, so Eric, so question, about the, question about the process. So you, you went through, uh, you know, over the past 12 months or so, you you were able to upgrade about 40 of the 60 clients. What was the hardest part about that conversation with clients, um, you know, in terms of changing expectations? Or what was the support, or was there anything surprising about the process? 
You know, I, well, that's an interesting question. I, um, I'm having to think on my feet here. I think the hardest part of the process was kind of surprising in that I thought it would be the client would blow up at us for telling him <laughs> that we had to make a change. We thought we were worried that our clients thought once I have a BDR, I'm done and I don't have to do anything anymore. I just keep paying this fee. Um, so the hardest part was not about convincing them to do it. They understood that that refresh needs to happen. Um, the hardest part was just kind of working with them on the details of when could we do it and you know what's the most convenient timing. Uh, you know what does this mean for their his their data history. You know if if they have all this data out there that they were backing up before, what do we do with it now? Those kinds of conversations, I suppose, were the hardest. But I don't think there was anything too terribly hard. OK, great. But th then you asked me a follow-up question or a subsequent question. No, I, I think you, a, yeah, no, I think you answered that it wasn't, it, it was the big surprise was that it wasn't as, when you really focus the conversation around, you know, fulfilling the promise and what's required to do that from a hardware perspective in terms of quality, it, it made the conversation a lot easier. I think that's, I mean, we're, we've been, you know, we've been very impressed with what you guys have accomplished, but the way you kind of laid out how to go about having the conversation around quality and reliability and, and making sure you have the right equipment out there, it's, it's not surprising you've been able to achieve these numbers. Yeah, well, you know, one of the things you said um, has been really core to how we've done this is that we've really used this language about keeping our promise everywhere. So we have a document internally here that's our promise document that defines what are the promises we make to our clients so that we can show that to all of our new staff when they start and that we can revisit that and say, how are we doing on keeping that promise? Um, and, and so we've started talking with our clients in that language too. And when you talk about it that way, I think that is a trust-building way to talk to people. So if we think that the BDR they have is really no good anymore and needs replacement, we will sit down and we'll say, our job here is to make promises to you that we can keep and to recognize when we can't keep them and to tell you, even if it's not easy. And right now, what we believe is the BDR you have was the right BDR for the day we bought it, but it is outdated technology today and there are better solutions that are much better at keeping the promise. And I think people are very comforted by that language. They want to know that someone's looking out for them, that their partner's being an advocate for them. And we found that a lot of these conversations really strengthen the relationship. So. Fantastic. All right. Reason number six. Let me hit my, oh, sorry. This is my very first time using PowerPoint. I'm just kidding. <laughs> All right. Preparing for growth, here's the deal. We, no matter how much we estimate our clients are going to grow in their use of data, it seems that they almost always exceed the projections. And I don't know if that resonates with others on the call, but it seems like it happens all the time for us. And, and when we talk to our clients, you know, about this relook, it gives us a chance uh, about replacing legacy hardware with something new. It gives us a chance to acknowledge that, to say to clients, you know what, we're trying to prepare for growth here. We don't know exactly um, how much you're going to grow. And so here's how we think you should buy backup services that prepare you for this somewhat unpredictable growth. We think you should buy the device. And we think that you should own it. And there's security for you, though, uh, in owning it. And the security is we can upgrade this thing. So if we make the wrong assumptions about growth and you need more capacity, there's some there's growth room within the device that we're recommending. Um, and then you should buy that thing. And by the way, now that we sell BDRs to clients, we sell them at a margin. It used to be that we sold BDRs, um, or we didn't sell them. We owned them, and we just charged a fee to install them that was equal to our cost to acquire them. Now what we do is we sell them directly to the client. We might, we charge a margin. Our salespeople make commission off of it now, um, and, or off the actual device sale, and uh, we make money off of it. Um, but by having them buy the device, 
Now we're making pricing easier for them to understand. So in our old world where we own the device, part of their payment to us every month was sort of a payment to rent the device. And then part of the payment was for the amount of data we were backing up. Now what we get to do is disconnect those things. We get to say, all right, well, we're going to charge, we're going to sell you this BDR at some markup and you're going to buy it. And then your monthly fee is some minimum based on some allowance of data, but then there's a predictable, easy to understand cost per gigabyte after that. What we do with our pricing uh, to prepare for growth is now, now we've taken out the ability to make a lot of money on the device. You know, used to, our, our dream had been, well, that monthly fee we'll get from clients will keep paying for this device over and over and over. And once we've paid off the old brand B BDR, we'll still collect that every month. And it's just cash in our pockets, except as I said, that didn't come true because the devices didn't work and we had to replace them. Now what we do is we have our margin in the storage. And we say, all right, you'll pay us X per gigabyte per month, and our minimum pricing there is three times our cost. So very significant margin. It's our intention that when we sell BDRs, we have to get at least 66 points of margin. Preferably, we need to be at four times cost an hour, so that we're making 75% margin uh, on data storage with BDRs. And, and we're making it easier for our clients to understand what they're buying, and we, we protect our ability to make money in that case. So we use the eFolder partner cost wizard, the spreadsheet that's, I guess, again on the screen, in order to frame out what we think our costs will be. And then we take those monthly costs and we triple them as a baseline for how we price it for the clients. And I uh, kind of leaked into my seventh, <laughs> my seventh slide here. But reason number seven is we believe that now that we have the devices that keep the promise, we are not investing huge amounts of time cleaning up messes and solving problems with BDRs. Now we have a platform where we can price these things and make the profit that we want to make. So we really do make margins that exceed 66 points on BDRs month after month. And we have a pretty significant revenue line every month that comes from BDR services. So I believe that business continuity disaster recovery should be our most profitable offering because we add a huge amount of value beyond the functionality of the BDR. We add our professional consultative services to it by giving them advice through the sales process. Um, and we add value by making, by making the promise and being committed to keep it. There's a huge amount of value there just by extending that, that trust or just by extending that promise to a client. So we try to always sell based on the economic value of the uptime, not based on our cost. And, you know, if people are comparing cost to, you know, popular consumer backup solutions, you can get, I mean, everybody knows, you can get very inexpensive per gig backup options, but they are not apples to apples. And it's very important to be comparing apples to apples when you look at price and to be able to communicate to clients what the value proposition is per gigabyte of storage in a BDR versus, you know, some non-BDR solution that doesn't offer virtualization or doesn't proactively test the data and, and alert you when there's a problem, or frankly, where you don't really know the people who are protecting the data and you don't know if you can trust them. So there's a huge amount of value, and I would really encourage everybody to consider how much more money you can make because you're taking on such enormous risk. You should have high profit. Uh, in your BDR business. So just to go to the last slide to, uh, of my piece to wrap up, yeah, of the 60 BDRs, we've now replaced 40 of them last year. We've also done, I think, 15 new deployments of eFolder BDRs last year. Um, we have, what would that be, sextupled our, our revenue uh, on a monthly basis with eFolder in the last year. Um, BDR services are still the most profitable uh, offering that we have. And we're getting ready to roll them out on IBM servers, which I'm super excited about. And by the way, IBM is too. So if you don't feel like you have quite enough traction with your server vendor, it can be a really great way to show them more business very quickly by adding BDRs to the mix. So that's basically uh, my story, Ted. And I want to kind of hand it back to you or to anyone on the call who has any questions or comments you want to make. Yeah, well, great. Thank you, Eric. So you want to remind everybody, um, 
please uh, ask questions and submit them now. I just want to make a couple uh, quick comments um, and then open it up for kind of formal Q&A with the last section. Um, but just, just, uh, just in case, um, uh, you, you may not be familiar with eFolder BDR for Shadow Protect. Um, just want to make a couple comments. I mean, what we do is we take software, hardware, and cloud services and combine it in a total turnkey solution for the IT channel. Um, as Eric mentioned, we, we give choices to, you know, in all cases, the solution leverages StorageCraft Shadow Protect software to actually do the imaging of the production server environment. And then you have a choice of what kind of BDR appliance you use. You can either use the eFolder BDR appliance. Eric's deployed 40 of those, and he's getting ready to uh, do a, what we call a build-your-own BDR type, type solution. And really, the, the key here is um, the software, in either case, the software and the cloud is the same, but you have a choice of what kind of hardware you put into the equation. And so that deployment scenario is depicted uh, down below here. And, you know, so again, you're using the, the StorageCraft Shadow Protect software to do the imaging of the servers, and you're using the eFolder cloud to protect the data and provide uh, various disaster recovery options for your business and your clients. But you can put it on a third-party server, whether it's IBM, HP, Dell, or whatever your preferred brand of server hardware might be. So the name of the game here is really choice. Um, and the, the, the key cost drivers, you know, the, the, the price, the rate card, if you will, the wholesale rate card is modular. Um, so if you are, for instance, uh, sourcing the BDR appliances from eFolder, they range anywhere from $1,800 or $1,750 um, up to about $8,000. As Eric mentioned, they're highly customizable on shipment, or you can use your preferred uh, brand of, brand of uh, hardware. And then you have the cost for the cloud services and the software. And so um, really the choice is yours, and that's really the name of the game. Before we go into formal Q&A, um, what I want to introduce is an upgrade offer that we are running for any partners that are here on the line today. And um, this is a limited time offer, first of all. So um, every partner that joined today's webinar um, has access to this offer, and here's what here's here's how it works. If you are upgrading any legacy competitive BDR that you're decommissioning from the field, um, eFolder will provide 25% off um, a new eFolder BDR for Shadow Protect or eFolder BDR for Aperture. So eFolder has two different BDR product lines. So if you are sourcing the hardware from us, this is our recognition that. You know, we go back to the, the comments Eric made around having that conversation with clients about owning the infrastructure and upgrading and investing in quality. That's all true, but still, as we also mentioned, there is no free lunch. I mean, you know, the hardware does cost, and, it's, and we, we give um, partners choices, and we provide premium hardware that is highly reliable, and it's not, in some cases, not cheap. Right. So, well, but what we also recognize is that um, we are growing this business together with our partners, and so um, we are putting this offer on the table to help you accelerate um, the process of upgrading and refreshing your installed base, displacing competitive equipment, and really getting in a position where um, you have the reliability and peace of mind that Eric talked about today. He is almost done with upgrading his entire installed base to eFolder and is experiencing uh, you know, great results, both in having that peace of mind that he, can keep, he and his company can keep their promises, but also in the continued generation of high profit um, revenue streams from business continuity services for his clients. So you will receive an email from uh, my colleague Patrick Irwin right after this webinar um, asking you if you're interested in this offer. And if you are, there will be a very short form to fill out. And then what we will do is we will send you three vouchers. And you can use those vouchers now between now and the end of June um, to upgrade any competitive units from the field. And you will be able to apply that 25% off from any new eFolder BDRs you deploy. So um, with that, why don't we um, 
go to the Q&A log. Who's got questions for Eric or for me? Please go ahead and ask away. Don't be shy. This is your only chance to do so, OK? Um, question, a que couple questions are coming in here. Who handles replacing the failed hardware? So you know, our assumption in most cases, let me just go back to the upgrade offer. You know, our assumption in most cases is that you, know, you have complete client uh, ownership and control. Um, our only requirement here is from a, from a hardware perspective is that you are decommissioning the unit and that you supply us details um, about the decommissioned hardware. We're not forcing you um, to uh, ship in the unit or recycle it. We're asking you to simply tell us you know, what brand, what size, how much storage and RAM and cloud storage is being utilized in that client environment and uh, tell us about that. And in exchange, we'll give you the 25% off. But we presume in most, you know, in, in nearly all cases, you have control of the client relationship, and you will actually go out there and do the field upgrade. Um, you know, and it's and it's your it's in in all cases, it's your choice on what you charge the client. So this 25% savings can either be that little little shot, you know, that shot of uh, extra gross margin, which can help you facilitate the upgrade process. Eric didn't talk a lot about his cost. Uh, but maybe he could comment on that. I mean, even with clients, you know, even with clients paying for the new BDRs, you also have had some costs in, in, in driving this whole upgrade process, correct? Yeah, I mean, there, to be honest, there are just some clients where we didn't feel right telling them to buy a new BDR. We felt like it was our responsibility to, to give them hardware we believed in. So. So yeah, there are times when we just went to the client and said, you know, it's time to get different hardware, not because you've outgrown what you have, but because we don't think we can keep our promise. And we want to keep our promise to you. So we're going to work through this. And yeah, we chose to pay for them. But and it was expensive. And, and we're not made of money. But it was the right thing to do. And the goal was to be able to have a clear conscience and to be able to sleep at night knowing we were doing the right things to take care of clients. Right. So, so this offer, you know, whether whether you are having the client pay for the the new appliance or whether you are uh, keeping it on keeping title and keeping it on your own balance sheet, you know, this offer is is an opportunity for you to reduce the wholesale cost from eFolder for competitive displacements and. Um, you know, Ryan asks, um, have you documented who is attending to ensure that we will be able to obtain the 25% vouchers? Yes, the GoToWebinar platform keeps track of who attended today, and we will, um, you know, make the vouchers available to every partner organization that attended today. Um, and if you're not yet an eFolder partner, one of the there's two ways to become an eFolder partner. You either uh, sign an agreement and make a minimum revenue commitment of hundred dollars a month, or you buy at least one BDR appliance. So this may be um, the catalyst and opportunity to, to kick off your partnership with eFolder by by sourcing your first BDR appliance from us and starting your relationship formally. So um, let's see here. David wants to know. Um, how does SQL backup work with eFolder and the BDR? And what I'll say is that SQL, um, SQL is one of the most commonly uh, protected database applications with a BDR environment. Um, you know, in fact, with eFolder BDR for Aperture, there are some unique software capabilities in the Aperture um, imaging and uh, data verification that actually do a um, extra extra levels of integrity checking on the actual BDR appliance to make sure that the SQL data that's protected um, is 100% intact. So, you know, if you're not that familiar with how eFolder does business, I mean, our philosophy is to innate, is to partner with the IT channel, managed service providers, and VARs, and give you an open cloud infrastructure, and then plug in various software solutions like StorageCraft, Shadow Protector, Dell, Aperture software that we feel are best in class. And again, just like with BDR appliances, provide our partners with choice. So some partners prefer Aperture, other partners prefer Shadow Protect, 
In Eric's case, um, STC is standardized on, on StorageCraft Shadow Protect flavors of the solution, um, but uh, it's worth looking at both of them for the, te the relative technical merits of each. Um, let's see here. So um, let's see here. Um, will the presentation, Carrie wants to know, will the presentation be shared with the group? <clears throat> the answer is yes. Um, and uh, <clears throat> well, then Matt Michael wants to know, do we use Microsoft Storage Server? And the answer to that question is um, yes. I mean, in, in all in all the cases, in all the applications we've kind of talked about today, either with with um, with Aperture or Shadow Protect, what we ship on the E folder BDR is Windows Storage Server, and um, that's what we recommend is the, the most common deployment scenario, um, if, even if you're doing build your own. Um, and let's see, I'm not seeing any other questions. Any final questions? Eric, any, any final thoughts? You know, <laughs> yes. But, and I, I hope this is okay that I say this, Ted, but for people, I, I just want to say, for people who haven't dealt with people at eFolder before, the most important thing that I believe makes our relationship with eFolder a good one is that to a person, every single person we talk to at eFolder has integrity and you can trust them. And I just really want to vouch for how, you know, I tried to talk about how important that is, but you know, it's hard to prove, and everyone makes claims about it, but every interaction we have with people throughout that company has, a, has been a positive, constructive interaction. And so, so often what we're trying to figure out is can we really believe the claims we're going to hear or that we're hearing? And so often we find disappointment uh, when the claims uh, exceed the value that we get. And I just really want to endorse eFolder. I'm not being paid to do this, by the way, <laughs> but, um, or nor was I asked to. But um, I, I think it's such a great team of people committed to delivering on their promise. Um, I'm grateful to, to be their partner. Well, Eric, we appreciate that. We appreciate that. And you know, I think if, if anybody's, uh, you know, I think one of the things we try to do as a company is if you're looking to do business with us is to connect connect our partners with people considering doing business with us because our, our partners will say it best and have the best insights into what an experience is like in working with us. So uh, Eric, we do appreciate the, uh, the endorsement um, and the comments. Um, just want to remind everyone at a purely just tactical level, um, keep an eye out for my email for an email from my colleague Patrick Irwin. Um, inviting you to opt in, if you will, to the upgrade offer. Um, we have a, just a quick uh, two-question form that we, we need some feedback from you on uh, before we send the vouchers to you. And um, uh, I think that wraps it up. Eric Thorsell with Success Computer Consulting, I want to thank you for sharing your experiences and insights um, with everybody who gathered with us today on today's webinar. And um, uh, thank you. Thank you, Eric. Okay. And thank you to everybody for taking the time out of your day. We're just about out of time here. Uh, this is Ted Holsey with eFolder signing off on another eFolder partner webinar. Thank you. Take care now.